Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 10, and really it's the text for this morning and for this evening. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28, it, um, it, you'll, you'll notice at first it's, it's very familiar because we've, we've looked at it in Matthew, we've looked at it in Mark, but there is a different twist that um, is, is on this particular text and a parable that is connected to it, which we're very familiar with, the parable of the Good Samaritan that isn't connected to it in its other contexts, uh, very likely because this is an altogether different event. So uh, even though it may appear to be the same on the surface, it's going to take us in slightly different directions. So let's, um, let's look at it now in, in Luke chapter 10, uh, verses 25 through 37, and we're going to be looking just at verses 25 through 28 this morning. This is what uh, Luke writes, and a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him, and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Well, may the Lord bless His Word to our um, understanding this morning, particularly verses 25 through 28, uh, where our Lord tells us how it is we are to love God. Now, again, as uh, we begin a new year, uh, I think it uh, is very helpful to us to remind ourselves what it is that we are really all about as Christians why it is the Lord made us in the first place, Uh, why it is He redeemed us, Uh, what it is that the Lord wants us to do with our lives. In other words, why we're here. Well, we can see from our text that the answer is not a mystery. It's not a mystery what it is God wants us to do. It may be difficult to do it, impossible apart from the grace of God, but it's no mystery. We are here to love God, and we are here also to to love others. You know, this is really what the Lord aimed at in our salvation. That's the reason why He redeemed us in the first place. We think about the idea of easy believism, the fact that you just simply pray a prayer and then you can go about your way and you can still hate God and you can still hate your fellow man and you can still go to heaven. It short circuits everything that the Bible is about. Everything that God intends in His work of salvation is to turn us away from what we were, uh, rebels and haters of God and man, and to turn us into the direction of love. That's what the commandments are all about. We've seen that again and again and again. As Paul tells us as far as what summarizes the commandments with regard to our neighbor is we shall love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Our Lord Jesus does the same thing here. This is really what's behind everything in Scripture and God's plan. This is originally why He made us. And I I already pointed out in the garden when He made Adam and Eve and gave them that commandment, He was simply asking them to express that love, 
which He had already put in their hearts toward Him and toward others. When they broke that commandment, they hated God, they hated man, and you know it was an ultimate act of hatred toward us as His children. Look at what it did to us. And we do believe in some sense Adam understood that, what would have happened to us. But this is what the Lord made us for. This is what we are to aim our lives at. Now, since that is the case, I think it would be wise for us, especially if we want uh, to uh, fulfill the purpose for which God made us, to evaluate what it is that we're actually doing and to see why it is we're doing what we're doing to see if it really lines up with what God made us to do, what His purpose is for us. And not just in what we're doing on this day, because you know as well as I do, there are so many people today who name the name of Christ, say they're Christians, go to church on Sunday, but they don't give any of their lives, any of the rest of their time or their resources or you know, their, their affections to God the rest of the week. We are to be full-time Christians, giving, you know, giving Him these things, not just on this day, but in everything that we do, in our work, even in our recreations, our relationships. Paul tells us that the direction of our lives is to be the glory of God, whether we're eating or drinking, and that, of course, having to do in the context with eating meat, a sacrifice to idols, but he, he brings it down to, even to the very mundane things of life. Whatever you put in your body, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And of course, if we are to do it for His glory, we have to do it with this motive. We know that whatever we do means nothing to God. That's what the whole purpose, well, the, the, the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 13. Paul tells us even if you have the greatest gifts and make the greatest sacrifices, if you do that with any other motive in your heart than love for God, it means nothing to Him. And so if we are to glorify God with our whole lives, then everything we do has to be with this motive behind it. We need to love Him. This is what God made us to do. Now, what I'd like to do this morning is look at how the Lord actually does call us to love Him with our whole being, not so much focusing on the first four commandments which uh, express what it is God wants us to be doing, as, as we've already heard earlier, that unless we keep the commandments, we really don't love God. We really don't love Jesus as we ought to love Him. We don't really love our neighbors we ought to. But I want to focus on the heart, the motive, the, the devotion that this should bring about in our lives in every area for His glory. And this evening, I want us to focus on the second greatest commandment, which is that we love one another, and all men, as we love ourselves. Now, we do need to realize at the outset that since none of us here do any of these things perfectly, that we are going to receive some reproof from the Lord for our sins. But we need to be encouraged at the same time that the Lord knows fully well, you know, our weaknesses and our infirmities, and He has even made provisions for those things, that they might be cleansed away in Christ and that we might be strengthened by His Spirit uh, within so that by the power of His Spirit, we can actually grow in these areas and become more like Jesus Christ. But let's not forget, it's going to require effort on our part to do that. Regeneration, the new birth, this gift of salvation, the ability to trust in the Lord comes sovereignly from God. But once He quickens us to life, sanctification or growing in love is a joint effort. We work together with God to grow in grace. If we resist Him, we won't grow. But if we work with Him, we will. So let's um, seek by His grace to grow in this area. So first of all, this morning we're going to consider that we are to love the Lord and not just with part of our hearts, not just with part of our lives but with everything that we have, all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, the first question I want to ask, I don't know if you picked this up in this particular text because it does come to us with a slightly different twist. The first question we want to ask about this text is Jesus telling us here that we need to do this in order to enter into heaven. 
Are these the qualifications of, um, of basically salvation? Well, you know, as I said, typically we see Jesus see, uh, speaking these words in a slightly different context. If you were to look in Matthew's gospel and Mark's gospel, uh, Jesus tells us there that we are to love God in this way and we are to love our neighbor, but He does it in answer to the question, what is the greatest commandment in the law? But you see here the question is, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Which sounds very much like the rich young ruler, the question that he brought to Jesus, good master, good teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus points him in the same direction. Now I do want us to, to realize though that though these are different questions, they're really asking the same thing. I mean, we would expect that what we must do to inherit eternal life would be the same as the greatest commandment, especially when we understand that what makes it greatest is the fact that it summarizes everything that the Lord calls us to do. This is the purpose for which He made us. We have to live up to that purpose, you see, in order to enter into heaven. But of course, if I put it this way, it raises the other question. Is Jesus here telling us when He agrees with the answer of this lawyer in, in having to love God in this way and love our neighbor, He says, do this and you will live. Is Jesus teaching us that we are saved by our works? Is He teaching us that you won't be saved unless you can actually meet these qualifications and love God in this way and love your neighbor in this way? Boy, that's a trick question, isn't it? Because the answer to this is yes. That's exactly what you must do, and it's exactly what I must do. For us to enter into heaven, you do have to love God with your whole heart. You do have to love your neighbor as yourself, and you know you can't fail at any point in your life. You have to do this from the moment of your conception, when you enter into the world, to the moment that you leave it. You cannot fail at even one point. That is God's standard. Jesus answered the question the same way each time He was asked, do this and you will live. But you see, on these grounds, are you going to go to heaven and am I going to go to heaven? Well, no, because none of us can do this. Each one of us have failed. I mean, what's one of the most popular verses or best verses to use when you want to point to somebody uh, to the fact that they can't be saved by their works? Nobody is good enough. Well, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is the standard, but this standard condemns each one of us because we are unable to keep these commandments. We came into the world with a heart already opposed to God and in our youth committed many sins and even after we came to Christ committed many sins. But that's why we can't be saved by our works. As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse because curse is the one who doesn't abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. We can't keep the standard. And if we try to keep it and try to justify ourselves by the standard, we will come under the curse. But you see, here is the beauty of the gospel. The gospel is good news. And what we've just heard so far isn't really good news, is it? Because it condemns us. But the good news is this, that even though we were sinners, and while we were still sinners, God had mercy on us and sent His Son into the world to do what we could not do, to love God with all of His heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love His neighbor as He loves Himself. Jesus did what we couldn't do. Jesus met the standard. And the gospel tells us that if you will only trust Jesus, if you will only receive by faith as a free gift what it is He has done, He will give you that righteousness. He will give you that record of obedience so that when God looks at you and sees you in Jesus Christ, He will see you as one who has loved Him with your whole heart and one who has loved his neighbor as he loves himself. And He will give that to you freely without cost. That is the gospel. Now, at the same time, I want us to realize, again, we want to, we want to make sure we, we don't understand what Jesus is saying here, is telling us 
that we need to be perfect in and of ourselves before we enter into heaven. You know, Luther described this and the Reformers described this righteousness of Christ as an alien righteousness, as a righteousness that does not belong to us. It's not one we worked for, but it's one that Jesus worked for and He gives to us. We need to understand that is what saves us. But does that mean, having received the Lord Jesus Christ, that I can go on being His enemy, I can hate God and I can hate man? No. The whole purpose of redemption, the whole purpose of God giving us His Son was to turn us away from our hatred and actually to make us love Him. The gospel doesn't change the standard. The gospel only ensures that we can meet the standard, that what we failed to do, God provides through someone else. But, of course, even in the area of obedience where we fail, God gives us the power to do what we could not do before. The gospel, in other words, doesn't free us from the standard. It doesn't free us from obedience, but rather it frees us from the thing that stood in the way of our obedience so that now we can freely do what God calls us to do. It frees us from the power of sin and gives us the power to obey. You know, Jesus has made a provision not only for our guilt through His atoning death and for our lack of righteousness through His obedience, but He has also made provision for the heart problem we had. He gives us His Holy Spirit to produce love in our hearts so that we might love Him, trust Him, and that we might grow in our love for the Father and also in our ability to love our neighbor, but we're going to focus, as I've said, on our ability to love God in the way that He calls us to love Him. So is this a standard by which uh, we're saved? Is this what we need to do to enter into heaven? Well, yes, it is, unless we have a perfect righteousness we're not going to enter into heaven, but Jesus has provided that righteousness. We need to trust in Him. But then what about our own practical, personal obedience? Is that unimportant? No, it's very important. But Jesus has made provision for that as well through His Holy Spirit. He gives us the ability to love Him, to love the Father and to love our neighbor by His Holy Spirit. Now, the second question is, how does the Spirit help us to do this? Well, you know, here's one thing that isn't focused on very often, although we have focused on it in the past, and that is that when the Spirit of God brings us to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, He does something within us that allows us to see something that we could not see before. Now, if you're a Christian here this morning, perhaps you take it for granted that when you look at God, you see something beautiful. When you look at Jesus Christ, you see someone who is desirable. But why is it that you see that? Well, it's because the Spirit of God opened your eyes. The Bible tells us in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that uh, when we were dead in trespass and sin, there was a veil that was over our eyes, that we were blind, that we could not see the glory of God. But through the gospel, the Lord removes that veil so we can see the glory of Christ and be drawn to Him. Now, Puritans wrote about this. We don't see a lot about it today, but it, it is true. When the Spirit of God removes that veil and we see what God really looks like, then we realize immediately that He is the most beautiful thing that we have ever seen, the most beautiful being, the most desirable being. He has all the beauties, all the virtues, all the graces of, of the things that you have ever seen in this world all wrapped together into one. We can't even imagine how beautiful He is, and yet we know we've seen something of it. Because the Scripture tells us, as a matter of fact, that the Spirit of God did open us to see, open our eyes to see those things. I don't know if you realize this or not, but this is the reason why you actually trusted Jesus in the first place. It wasn't just because you saw your need. You had to have a change of heart that changed your desire for Him. Because even if you, let's say, knew that there was one who was able to save you from death and destruction from hell, and yet every time you looked at Him, you were repelled, you were repulsed because you hated Him, 
because you hated everything that he was about. You hated the sight of him. You hated his words. You hated his character. You still wouldn't come to him. You couldn't because your heart would stop you. No, the, the Spirit of God had to do something in your heart as well. He had to open your eyes, remove the veil, reveal the beauty of Jesus Christ to you. And when He did that, and when you saw His beauty and desired Jesus Christ and saw just how perfect a Savior He is, basically you couldn't resist anymore. You know how your heart is drawn toward things you love. That's what we go after our entire lives. Whatever it is we love, that's what we go after. Well, God changes the love problem. He gives you love for Christ so you, your heart is drawn out toward Him, and that's what you do. You begin to go towards Him. You begin to trust Him. You couldn't resist because you didn't want to resist. That's why you came to Him. That's why you trusted Him. Now, you may not have understood that when it first happened, but that's the way it is. And everyone who has come savingly to Jesus Christ has seen that same glory, has seen that same beauty. If you haven't seen it, you haven't really come to Him as you ought. So the Spirit of God is the one who opened our eyes to see that. He's the one who, in, in opening our eyes, basically drew our hearts out to the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us that love for Him. He produced that love for Him that we might do this, that we might love Him and that we might love the Father. By the way, the Spirit of God opened our eyes to several other things at the same time, to the things that God has stored up for us in heaven, to eternal life, to spiritual things, to everything basically that has to do with Him. That veil, when it was removed, not only took away our hatred for God, but also for everything that has to do with Him. In 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10, Paul writes this, Things which eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. He opens our eyes to see the beauty of God. He opens our eyes to see the beauty of Christ. He opens our eyes to see the beauty of what it is God has prepared for those who love Him. And the Spirit of God also showed us at the same time that all the things that we've been enjoying in this world up to this time, which would include not only life and health and food and clothing and, and uh, friendship and all the different things we have, that all those things as well have come from God. James tells us every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. You know, before we came to Jesus Christ, we were, I don't know, thanking nothing, you know. Isn't it great? Isn't it lucky that we have these things, even though people are starving in other countries and so forth? You weren't thanking God for those mercies, and neither was I. But the Spirit of God opened our eyes to see where these things come from. Now, again, why did the Spirit of God do this? Why did He open our eyes to the beauty of God and Jesus Christ? Why did He open our eyes to show us all that God has prepared for us? Why has He shown us that everything we have in this world comes from God? It's because He wants us to love Him. He wants us to see things as they really are, that these things all do come from Him, that God really is beautiful, that heaven really is a glorious place, so that we will love Him as we ought to love Him. And what is, what is the end of all of this? I mean, just how much does God want us to love Him? Well, when you really stop and think about it, He wants us to love Him as much as Jesus Christ loved Him, as much as His Son. God wants to be what He should be in your life, the very center of your life. He wants you to love Him with a heart that is undivided, that has Him first and foremost. He wants to be the reason that you do everything that you do. In other words, He wants you to be devoted 
to him. That's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, when he says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices to God. Don't just give a part of your life to him. The Lord wants all of it. That's the reason He made you. That's the reason He redeemed you. That's the reason why He gives you everything He does in this world. That's why He's giving you everything He's going to give you in the world to come. The reason is that you might love Him and devote your life entirely to Him. Are you devoted to Him is the question that this text asks. And how can you know whether or not you are devoted to Him? Well, here's, um, here's some diagnostic questions to think about. What do you spend most of your time thinking about? What do you spend most of your time doing? What is it that you're pursuing more than anything else in your life? Uh, What is it that you want out of this world? What is it that you want out of your life? What do you want to do with your life? Well, all of these things that, you know, that are the answers to these questions are the things that you have actually devoted yourself to. Two, and the question is, is the answer to these questions God? Because that is what it should be. Do your thoughts, do your desires, do your actions show that you are, in fact, devoted to Him? Well, again, you need to be. You need to be devoted to Him because, again, what we've already seen, if you don't love Him, most of all, if you are not devoted to Him. There is no way that you're going to be able to serve Him in the way that He calls you to with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Now again, what does Jesus mean here when He uses these words? Well, there's a bit of overlap, but I think it's easy to summarize what it says. I mean, when He talks about your heart, He is referring to your affections. But he's talking about more than that. He's talking about your inner self. He's talking about your mind, your will, the person that you are. You are to love him with your whole person. Your soul refers to your inner self as well. You know, it's 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 you, the real you, not the, you know, the the material you, your body, but your soul, that part which has the person in it. You are to love him with all of that. Your mind refers to your understanding, your thoughts. Your, the intents of your heart, your will, and your strength, of course, has to do with your power, the might that God has given to you, not only your physical strength, but strength of mind, strength of will, strength of heart, or even any authority that you might possess. Basically, together, they add up to every faculty that you possess, every ability, every resource that you have. The Lord wants you to love Him with these things and to use them all for His glory and His honor only. That's why God made you. That's why He redeemed you. That's why He has given you the things that He has given you by way of gifts, talents, abilities, resources, time, energy, strength. The Lord wants you to use these things for Him. He wants you to love Him with these things. He wants you to love Him with every thought that you think in your mind. That's why the Lord tells us, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. He wants you to love Him with every desire of your heart. Your desires are to be pure and holy and directed toward holy things, the things that God wants you to do. He wants you to love Him with every decision that you make. I mean, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. Every action Every action you take, even in every word that you speak, whoever speaks, we are to speak, as it were, the oracles of God. We are to be His his spokesman. He made you that you might submit all your powers, everything He has given you to do His will. He wants your hands to be His hands, your feet His feet, your eyes His eyes, your mouth His mouth. He wants you to do what He would do if He were standing in your place, to want what He would want, and again, to say what He would say. Now again, God did not put us into this world to seek our own pleasure, to seek 
our own ends, our own goals, uh, to do what we wanted to do with our lives so that we might get the glory for it. We are to love Him with what He has given us and not ourselves. He is to be the goal. He is to be the end. He is the purpose for our living. Now, we do know that there is a self, a kind of self-love that God does allow where we do seek our pleasure, but, but we seek it in Him. Uh, we seek to store up riches in heaven where we get to enjoy them forever. I mean, that is self-love, but that's a good kind of self-love. But there is a kind of self-love that we know God doesn't want us to do because it's sinful, and that's when we seek our own pleasure, our own honor, our own glory, purely for ourselves and not for Him. God wants to be first in your life. He wants to be first in your heart. He wants you to do what you do for His glory and His honor and not yours. That's how much you are to love Him. And again, that's why He redeemed you. That's why He gave you His Holy Spirit. It's not so you'd have your fire insurance policy in your back pocket, you know, where I can, you know, the, the idea of the perseverance of, of the saints or what's called, you know, the, was it um, eternal security. Some people interpret that to mean that God redeemed me so I can know that I'm safe from hell and I can pursue the world and not worry about the consequences. That's what Christianity is about, they say. But that's exactly what it isn't. The Lord didn't redeem us so that we would pursue the things of the world. He, he redeemed us so that we would begin to pursue the things we ought to be pursuing. And that is that we might, out of love, give to Him everything we have and serve Him with our whole being. That, if we're not doing that, we're not doing what God made us to do. If we're not doing that, we are, in fact, sinning against the Lord. This is the reason why God made us and redeemed us. So then let's ask that final question that we always need to ask when we're confronted with something like this. Uh, we realize this is what God calls us to to be and what He calls us to do, and it's a very high standard. We came into the world completely unable to do it. God has redeemed us and given us the ability, but is it going to work automatically? The fact that we have the Spirit of God in us, does that mean that we're going to become what He wants us to become and it's going to require no effort on our part? Well, we've already seen sanctification is a joint effort between us and the Lord. There is something we must do not to save ourselves, the Lord does that all through the Lord Jesus Christ, but having saved us and having put this desire in our hearts to become more like Jesus Christ and to love God in this way, there is something we need to do in order to increase that love. We need to use the means of grace. Again, you've heard that term many, many times, but you know, just think of it in these terms. The Spirit is the one who created that love in your hearts. And He is the only one who can nurture it because He is that desire in your heart. If you love the Lord at all, it's because you have the Spirit of God living in you. His influence can be strong, it can be weak, but it is all of the Spirit. And so if you want that love to be stronger, you need the Spirit's work to be stronger in your heart. And I hope you know by now what it is you need to do to strengthen that work. You need to stoke that fire with fuel, and you can fuel it in several different ways. The Word of God is one of the main ways. You need to read the Bible. If I were to ask for a show of hands of how many of us read the Bible on a daily basis, I hope everybody would raise their hands, but remember, it's not just knocking out chapters. It's not just having the reading program and saying, I read my one chapter, my two chapters, my four chapters. It may have only taken me five minutes, but I got through it. Or when we're reading the Bible together, it's not just about saying I read you know, what I had to read today so that I've got the whole book read by the time we meet together. But am I listening to what it says? Am I receiving what it says in faith? Am I believing what it says? Am I embracing the promises that God holds out to me as I embrace the commandments that He commands me? And am I applying all of this to my life and seeking to walk in it? That is what pours fuel, as it were, on the fire in your heart of love and affection for God. Of course, there are other ways as well. Prayer. Think of prayer like oil as well, like fuel for the fire. 
Are you, are you praying? Are you praying alone? Are you praying together with your family? Are you praying uh, with the church as we meet together for worship and as we meet also for the prayer meetings uh, on Wednesday nights or even before the services? Those things also strengthen the work of the Spirit. And the more you have of the Spirit, the more you're going to love God because the more you're going to see His glory, the more you're going to see His beauty, the more you're going to want to serve Him and honor Him. Well, prayer is a very important way to build up that work of the Spirit, to increase it. You must worship Him. You must praise Him. I hope you spend time thanking Him, worshiping Him, singing hymns, singing psalms, singing praise songs to Him. Those things build you up as well as honor Him. Are you spending time fellowshipping with other believers? You need to do that because these things feed that fire. And, of course, I think it goes without saying that at the same time, you need to obey Him. You need to keep His commandments because every time you, you step out of His will and do something that is sinful, it is like pouring water on the fire. It's like putting the fire out. It's quenching the Spirit as you grieve the Spirit of God when you do things that are contrary to the commandments. Well, what is contrary to the commandments? Well, we are to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we are to love our neighbors. We love ourselves. And whatever we do that is contrary to that is like pouring water on the fire. We've got to get those things out of our lives that are contrary to God's will that are of the world. Everything that is of the world that is produced pretty much by the people of the world is going to quench the Spirit of God because it is full of anti-Christian, anti-God thoughts, sinful thoughts. We need to make sure we stop feeding our minds and our hearts with things that are contrary to God's will. Now, I think we all know what those things are in our lives that we allow. If you want to grow in your love for the Lord, which is what God plainly calls you to do here, you need to let go of those things even though they may be fun. I remember Susanna Wesley's encouragement to her children. Whatever you do that weakens the work of the Spirit of God, that quenches your love for the Lord, that takes away your taste for spiritual things. Whatever you do that falls into that category, that is sin, and you should put it out of your life. So examine your heart. See what these things that you're allowing yourself to do do to your spirituality and take away those things that, that quench it. I mean, if you're trying to build a big fire and you're looking for fuel to make it bigger and bigger, you don't throw things on it that are going to put it out. You don't throw sand on it. You don't throw water on it, but you might throw gasoline you might throw some kind of oil, things that are flammable. You'll, you'll throw that into the fire. Well, the same thing applies here. You need to put those things into the fire, fuel it with the things that will make it burn brighter and not with the things that are going to quench it, that are going to rob you of love, rob you of joy, rob you of contentment and satisfaction in the Lord and so slow your progress into growing into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of quenching it, use what love the Lord has given you to move your heart towards those things that He has also given you to stoke the fire. Get more of this holy oil to put into the furnace of your soul so that it may burn more brightly for Him. Now, again, let's not, let's not forget, this is the beginning of a new year. A, a year is kind of an arbitrary thing, but it does point out to us that, um, you know, time is going by, and we only have so much time in which to serve the Lord. And all of us here have differing amounts of time. Some of us are young. Some of us are older. Some of you who are younger may actually die before some of us who are older. We don't know the day of our, of our death. We just don't. And we only have this one opportunity one life in which to actually love the Lord as He calls us to love Him. Um, and again, when you consider everything He's done for us, all that He is and all that He does, 
I mean, if you could rewrite any of it, would you, would you do that? If, would you have God any other way? Would you have Him do any other thing than what He does? He's perfect. And what He does for us is, is beyond, as it were, the perfection we think of. Again, while we were enemies, he, he made every provision for us in life, in this life, and in the life to come. He deserves that we would live for Him in this way, that we would love Him in this way, and we only have the opportunity to do that in this world during the years in which, of course, we have to live. So don't lose the opportunity. Don't waste your life. Don't give it to things that you shouldn't give it to. Don't give it to the world. Don't give it to your pleasures except for those pleasures that you find in Him. Give it to Him. Give it all to Him because He is worthy of your love. And by the way, I should mention as well, not only is it right and good that we should do this because of who He is and what He's done, but don't forget He even promises to reward you even further for the things that you do for Him in this world. The more you do, the more you're going to be rewarded. And it's just for this period of time in which we are alive in this world, which again, I hope it would encourage us to do all that we can for His glory and honor because He is worthy. Well, we've been exhorted this morning to love the Lord our God with all our resources, all of our faculties, our whole being, everything that we are. And I hope as we look at these things, and again, words, I mean, words really can't describe, you know, what it is I'm trying to describe. The only thing that could really convince you the way that you should be convinced is if you could see God. You have to see Him. You have to see Him through the eyes of faith. You have to read and believe what the, what the Word of God says, and the Spirit of God will show you. But that's what you need to see. All the words that I've spoken are, are really going to be meaningless unless you can actually see this. So I would encourage you to be in the means that God reveals Himself. Read the Word, pray, and pray that God would reveal that beauty to you so that you will give yourself to Him as you should. And so that you will also do, and I will also do what the Lord calls us to do with regard to our fellow man. We are to love them as well. And that's what we're going to be looking at this evening, that call to love our neighbor as we love ourselves and just exactly what it is we ought to be doing uh, to do that. You know, we're, our tendency is to focus on ourselves and our own needs, but we need to love others as we love ourselves, so we need to be focusing on their needs as well. So for now, let's focus on loving God. And by the way, loving our neighbor is another aspect of loving Him as well, isn't it? But let's think about these two things. This is why God made us. This is why He redeemed us. This is what He wants us to be about. So let's pray that God would give us the grace to do that. Let's uh, spend a few moments in prayer and ask Him to apply what we've heard.